Good evening to those of you who have joined. Uh, we're gonna wait a few more minutes, let others come on board, and then we will get started and break the bread of life together. So we're gonna wait a few more minutes. It's not quite seven yet. Denise, that's too loud. Okay, it is, uh, we got one more minute. Um, we're gonna give uh, one more minute, it's almost seven. People are still joining, and then we will open up in prayer and get going. If you, if you can hear me, uh, somebody say amen in the chat room, just to let me know that you can hear me. All right. Okay, we're gonna get going and others will join us in progress. Um, we are going to broach a subject tonight that I think uh, the upfront part is important. And so that's why I was trying to wait, but time is precious. It's a commodity that we cannot save, we cannot store, we cannot get it back. We can only redeem it. And so let's redeem the time. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the blessing of being able to come before your throne. You're a holy God, yet you accept us. We thank you for cleansing us with the blood of your dear son, Jesus Christ, that has made us clean, made us whole, and caused us to be acceptable in him. And so we come tonight with all humility, asking that you would give us the mind of Christ. We pray that the spirit of God would show us things that we know not of. Open our eyes now, God, that we might behold wondrous things coming out of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, and by him we give thanks. And we say, amen. Well, God bless you and welcome. Uh, we're gonna spend the next hour tonight uh, exploring Ecclesia, Ecclesia. And we're gonna do a series um, and this, this will be going on for um, at least a month, maybe longer. We'll see what the Lord says. Um, let's go to the first slide so that we can level set on the definition of ecclesia. For those of you who are on the phone and cannot see the slides, 
I will uh, try to speak clearly and slowly enough so that you can get the essence of ecclesia. Ecclesia is the Greek word translated in the New Testament as church. So anytime you see the word church, the Greek word is ecclesia. It comes from ek, E-K, meaning out from and to, out from and to, and kaleo meaning to call, and has to do with a group of people called out from one place and to another. It is an assembly or a congregation. The ecclesia in the New Testament is a group of people who have been called out of the world and to God. It is the church. So let's break that down a bit. It is the church. The building where we assemble um, is what in the Old Testament was called the temple, it was a gathering place. It was the place of meeting where you would go to meet God. And there's something about the assembling together. There's something about the fellowship, but that is not how the church is defined. The church is a call out people. And that is ecclesia. In fact, right now, you are where you are, I am where I am, but we've gathered together. And so as the called out people of God, we're congregating. We're just not congregating in one place. And so the physical space doesn't define ecclesia or the church. When I'm at work, I'm still dwelling as part of the ecclesia. And I think that I, I pray that God will give us an understanding so that he can use us in an unusual way. One of the things that caused something to leap in me when I, as I was studying Ecclesia was the thought of Paul one day working. Um, and as you know, he was a tent maker. And while he was at work, they came to him because there were some things that were needed. People were sick. Um, they were, uh, they had foul spirits. Um, you know, I was about to say they were possessed, but I guess you could even say that. But Paul had to work. So what he did was he gave them a piece of his clothes. The Bible says an apron, an apron. And he gave them handkerchiefs that had touched him. And he gave it to them. And the Bible says God did unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. People were healed and the spirits came out. Paul didn't physically go there, but the people who came to him because they were a part of Ecclesia had that go and do the work of the ministry. And Paul knew that even though he was at work, his anointing never failed. And I believe that God wants us to be in this pandemic, the ecclesia, so that the presence of God is everywhere that we are. It's not just about coming together in a place on Sunday. Ecclesia is constant. Ecclesia is always present. And if we are a called out peculiar people, everywhere we go, that's where the church is. If you show up in ShopRite, then the church is in ShopRite. It's not about conduct or behavior, it's about presence. And the presence of the living God, we are a dwelling place for God. We are a dwelling place for a holy God. And so we are a called out people. We are people who've been called out of the world into the kingdom of God. 
And that's why the Bible says we are in the world, but not of the world, because we have been called out and we have been transformed. We have been changed. So let's now go to the next slide. I want to do a couple of things. I want to show a few biblical expressions of ecclesia to lay a foundation. And then I want to do a case study so that we can look at an example so that we can avoid this because the church of the living God is invisible. But there are things that create boundaries, artificial boundaries, like doctrine, like uh, denominations, and so many other things. You know what I'm talking about. And that is not the way God sees his church. That is not the way God sees his people. And so we want to understand ecclesia in a way that removes bias. The first example is in 1 Peter 2, 9, and 11. And it says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now, I want you to understand something. This is written by Peter, the chief apostle who was sent to the Jews. Peter was so Jewish in his orthodoxy that God had to raise up Paul and send him to the Gentiles because Peter wasn't ready to receive that ministry. Even though he was with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry, there were some things in Peter that God had to work out, but he's at a point of maturity where he's speaking to a Gentile audience and he's saying, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. There's something about ecclesia that causes us to mature. There might be some things in me and in you today that God isn't finished with. But if we're a part of the ecclesia, we'll come to see that the people who God has called out are his own special people. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out. Remember the definition of ecclesia is to be called out of one thing to another. Peter said he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You can see that expression of ecclesia very clear. Who once, he said, were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy and now have obtained mercy. Before the way you lived and because you were outside of the, the, the the presence of God, you were not a people, you didn't have mercy, but now that God has called you out of darkness into light, you are a special people, you are holy because God made you holy. When God touches you, something changes. And so it's, it's wonderful to see Peter who had um, cultural bias, see at this point that if God has called them, if God has called you out, if God has made you holy, then you are holy. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile. And I pray that Ecclesia would come to Philadelphia. So it doesn't matter if you're white, black, Hispanic, Asian, whether you are Presbyterian or Pentecostal, Lutheran or Methodist, that you are God's special people. And that is, that is what God sees. That is what God desires. And he's just waiting for his people to join in the expressions 
of ecclesia. Then we can be the church. We can be the kind of church that speaks with one voice. We can be the kind of church that walks together because we agree. And I'm, I am sensing that we are in a season where God is making that happen in the earth. Even though we are apart, we are together. And we're coming together under the banner of ecclesia. Matthew 5, 13 and 16, a different expression. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. If that salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? When salt is applied, it does several things. One, it's a preservative. For those of you who are from the South, you know when they're curing uh, meat and they're preserving it and they hang it up on those hooks, they salt it. Salt also adds flavor. And so Jesus is saying, if it's lost its savor or its flavor, what's, what good is it? Salt with no flavor doesn't serve one of its primary purposes. And so when, when God applies us to the world, we are to be salt and light. Things ought to be preserved because we're there. Things ought to taste better. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is everyone who trusts in him. We're his ambassadors in the earth. We represent him. And so we are the season that God has in the earth. Think of yourself as seasoned salt. You make the world better because you are here. It goes on to say, it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. I love it when Jesus tells us what we are. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Our presence ought to light up whatever room we're in. It's not just the lamp that has the light, but everybody benefits from the light that radiates from the lamp. And the light radiates with its greatest glory in darkness. When it's light and you put on light, you'll see some difference depending on the contrast and brightness. But when light shines in darkness, it's radiant. And that's what Jesus is saying. As the light of the world, you are to radiate the glory of God. You are the radiance of his glory. He said, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. But while he was still in the world, he said to the disciples, you are the light, the, the light of the world. I want you to know, God wants you to know that you are some of the things that you've not yet become. He said, as long as he's in the world, he's the light of the world. But he's saying to them, you are the light of the world. You already are because the word of God that's spoken to you says that it is so. And I'm glad, I'm happy to know that there are some things that I'm becoming that I already am. I just need to continue to walk in it. And I say by the spirit of God, the, the light that is in you will shine brighter and brighter as you walk towards him, brighter than the noonday sun. He says in verse 16, let your light so shine before men. You are the light of the world. Now all you have to do is let it shine. You are the light of the world. Let it shine that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. See your good works and glorify your father that is in heaven.
part of what Jesus came to do was to show us the Father. And in his ministry and in his life, even though his ministry was just over three years, he glorified God. In fact, in his priestly prayer, he asked his father to glorify him and to glorify himself. Jesus is now saying to Ecclesia, to the church, your works will glorify your father in heaven. There were times when Jesus talked to the disciples and he would say, my father. It would be personal. But when he was imparting something, he would say, your father. And that's how uh, doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas at the end, when he got a revelation after the resurrection, he said, my Lord and my God. He embraced something personal that Jesus was trying to impart from the beginning. That is the mystery of ecclesia, that as a body of believers, we carry the weight of the glory of God. And every time we walk in the will of God, every time we work a work that is of the, the will of God, we glorify our Father in heaven. And the good news is people see it. They see you when you mess up. They see you when you do good works. And that's why Jesus was admonishing them to do good works so that they will see it and they will glorify God. That is our mission. That's our reason for being. That's what the ecclesia is all about, is to radiate the glory of God, to demonstrate what it means to be a called out people. But we've got to know who we are, not just as individuals, but together. We live in a culture that promotes rugged individualism. It causes people to err concerning the scriptures. It causes so many people, part of the debate that we're having right now around justice and equity, biblical principles that are a part of the nature of God. Jesus came according to the prophet Isaiah to establish justice, to establish justice. And I talked to some people who I know they love God. We pray together, we talk together, but when it comes to a heartfelt conversation about inequity and racial justice or injustice, depending on which side of the fence you're on, it becomes clear to me that they view their personal life experience as justification that there is no wrong in the world. And there are many people who feel that way. It's like, personally, my salvation is based on my decision to follow Jesus Christ. And that is true. But there's something I've learned about the kingdom of God that's a mystery. In the world, things are binary. It's this or that. But in the kingdom of God, is it inclusive or is it exclusive, as an example? It's both. It's inclusive in that God loved the world so everybody can come. It's exclusive in that Jesus says, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. How does that apply to what I'm, the point I'm making relative to individuals who don't, who feel like I have nothing to do with the plight of people of color, specifically African Americans. I never owned any slaves. I never did any of that. In fact, I give to good causes. I mean, you, in fact, you're one of my good friends. That has nothing to do with it. But then I think 
Does that mean then that if you never accepted Jesus Christ with that logic, do you think you could go to heaven? What do you mean? Well, we were all born in sin because of what Adam and Eve, our, our original parents. So do you believe that humankind inherited that? Absolutely. So you believe that you inherited the sin of Adam, but you don't inherit what your, your fathers did three generations ago? That doesn't make sense. That kind of theo theological divide causes people to stay in their bias. And that, that the thing that gives me hope is that as we dwell together as one and in unity in ecclesia, God brings us to a place of maturity, just like he did for Peter, who now in 1 Peter 2 and 9 through 11 is calling people who he thought were doomed, who he thought were so dirty he couldn't even go in the same room where they were who were defiled in every way. The food they ate were defiled. Their practices were defiled. They were sinners, they were worthless. Now he's saying, you are God's special people. I wanna encourage you to, that God is doing something in the earth that is gonna bring us to a place of a knowledge of ecclesia, where people who have differences, people who see the world differently, who have different social constructs, who have different world views because we come together in one God and we're under one blood, the way they see the world is going to be different. And this rugged individualism that has shaped and framed our culture and the world view of so many is going to be swept aside because God is going to birth ecclesia. It's always been here. But until it's revealed in its fullness, you can't, walk, you can't walk in it. And so I am praying to the living God that the earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, just as the waters cover the sea, so that there would be none inside his church, his ecclesia, who are ignorant. There would be none who are driven by their worldview, but they would follow the spirit of the living God because when we do that, we are one. There will be no schism in the body of Christ. There will be no arguing and debating over things that don't matter. Paul in Hebrews 6 said to the people, when you should be on me, you're still on milk. You're still arguing over baptisms and days and all that. That has nothing to do with what God has called you to do. And so the, the whole point of doing this series on ecclesia is to bring us new covenant into a place where we bring the church to the world. And in some instances, we bring the church to the church because too many people have been programmed and conditioned to believe that the church is a Sunday morning thing that the church has an address, but ecclesia is invisible. It is wherever God is. It is by revelation. The entrance is something that you're born into. You don't join it. You don't join ecclesia. And we're gonna, we're gonna work that out a little bit more. If you're with me, somebody say amen in the chat room. We're now gonna look at Hebrews 10, 23, through 25, here is this, hear, hear what the word of the Lord said. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us hold fast, in other words, hold it tight. Don't let go the confession of our hope without work wavering. For he who promised is faithful. So it doesn't matter what happens to us. It doesn't matter how persecuted the church is. We know that the one who promised is faithful. So there's no reason to waver. The, the hotter it gets, the more I hope. The greater the tribulation, the more I hope. The, the more things are shaken, 
the more I don't waver. Come on, somebody. We've got to hold fast to our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another. This is ecclesia. It's not enough just for me to have hope. It's not enough just for you to have hope. We've got to consider one another. That's what ecclesia is about. We're in this thing together. I see you, Minister Baldy. I see you, Robert Mel. We hope together. If you lose hope, then I want to walk alongside you so that we can hope together, so that our heads can be lifted up, so that together we can soar like an eagle, so that if, on the day you're weak, maybe I'm strong. On the day that I'm weak, maybe you're strong, but we walk together. We're like a cord that can't be broken. That's what ecclesia is about. It's not everyone for themselves. It's all of us together. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. I hope there's somebody on the other end of this device who's stirring up love and good works, who's not stirring up confusion, who's not stirring up things that cause people to have their head down, but we're stirring up love and good works, not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together. I'm gonna to pause for a minute. I've always interpreted, because it's always been taught and preached to me, is this was my admonition to come to church. And I love coming to church, but assembling together doesn't necessarily mean we're congregating in the same place. We're together tonight. We're communicating tonight. We're under the same blood tonight. The same spirit is unctionizing us tonight. And so ecclesia is everywhere, all at the same time. I believe that's the reason Jesus never took on a building. He never had a building. All his disciples who became apostles and who preached, they did it from house to house. Other people built buildings and temples and named it after them. I often think as I'm driving and I see Church of the Apostle Paul or St. Peter, and I think Paul is rolling over in his grave. He's thinking, Has Paul, did Paul die for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? That kind of thing is something that the, the apostles and Jesus didn't do. In fact, Jesus said to the religious conservatives of his day, and I don't mean that in a political way, the religious orthodoxy of his day, you see that temple? Not one brick is going to be on top of the other. What was he saying? And when he died, the veil in the temple was torn too before the bricks came. He was saying, I'm coming to usher in a new way. I'm bringing in ecclesia. And so the thing that you have done, the things that you do in thinking that this is where you meet God is almost like when he was talking to the woman at the well, when she said, our fathers used to come here to pray. Jesus said, yeah, I know that. But now is the time where they who worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth, not on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He said, I'm changing this thing around. I'm bringing something that's going to reach you no matter where you are. That's ecclesia. He said, it's not going to be in this mountain and it's not going to be in Jerusalem. All the stuff that you treasure and you confine God to one little space. He's in you. God is in you. The kingdom of God is not by observation. It is within you. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Diane, I see your hand up. 
administrator, I'm going to break my own rule. I want to I want to hear this question. Would you please allow Diane to ask her question? Diane, you can ask your question. Diane, are you there? Okay, maybe that was just a mistake. Um, so I'm gonna assume, Diane, if you're not speaking, that even though I saw the hand up, that was not intentional. So let's let us move on. How do we enter the ecclesia? And I, I just want to um, say that I know that and just as Jesus said to Nicodemus, marvel not that I say unto you that you must be born again. So I understand the born again uh, experience for all of you orthodox um, scholars out there. But I want to show you something uh, here um, which fits with, because the word Ecclesia is in this verse. Matthew 16, 15 through 18, very familiar passage. Now, this is after Jesus had entered the coast of Caesarea Philippi, which was a place of great idolatry and the kind of place that a holy person would stay away from. I want you to know what the essence of ecclesia is. Jesus went to that very place. There is some, there's something about going to a place where self-righteous folk won't go. The greatest revelation that the, the, the disciples got was in a place that would be considered ungodly and unclean. When God tells us to go, when we obey and go, we see dimensions of God that we wouldn't see in a sterilized environment. So now he's entered in and he asked the first question, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And he said, well, some say Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then he said, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? So after he heard what they were saying in Jerusalem, he's now in Caesarea Philippi. He's like, now nah, I want to know who you say that I am. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That word church is ecclesia. There's a few things I want to point out before we get to our case study. Peter, being the same one that he was, just spoke what was in his spirit. And when he told Jesus who he was, Jesus then said, and I also say to you that you are Peter, Simon answered, and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. And I also, verse 18, say to you, when we get a re revelation of who Jesus is, he tells us who we are. You learn things about yourself that, you, that only God knows. But when we get a revelation of him, 
the first thing he does is he tells us who we are. He went from being the son of Jonah or the son of John, Simon, the son of John, to Peter, Petros, a rock. And he says, now that you have a revelation of the truth, my church, my church, my ecclesia is the pillar and the ground of truth. You're standing on ground now that is based on truth. And everywhere you go, you're going to be standing on that ground because my ecclesia is the pillar and the ground of truth. And as long as you abide, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Gates are designed to keep us out. The people of God can bombard hell anytime we want to take authority. They cannot prevail against the ecclesia. Today, in the overflow, at one point the, the, during the prayer, there was a prophetic utterance that said, all we have to do, my God, is take authority of this mountain. And the devil will have to retreat before he comes in. That's what Ecclesia is about. The gates of Hades, the gates of hell, cannot keep us back. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, I want my church to be on the offensive, not on the defensive. You should never be going backwards. You should be going forward. That's why he says the gates shall not prevail. The gates can't keep you out. The gates are to fortify someone. It's to keep them in. It's to protect them. We don't need protection against the devil. The devil needs protection against God's ecclesia. God needs protection. God gives us protection because he's present. The devil needs to be protected. We're dangerous. The ecclesia, the church of the living God is dangerous. The pillar and the ground of truth, the gates of hell shall not, it cannot, it will not prevail. The church, next slide please. The church of Jesus Christ is both invisible and universal. The word Catholic gets a bad rap. It means universal. But the doctrine causes us to run away from it. But we're not talking about a denomination. So when I say universal, I'm talking about the original intent of ecclesia, not a denomination that strayed from the word of God and kept the word of God from the masses. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a religion that had people pay indulgences or money so that their, their family members can be out of purgatory. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about whether you are in China or South Africa or Philadelphia or Delaware or New Jersey or Brazil, we are part of the ecclesia if we are in Jesus Christ. That's what I mean by universal. So now let us, let us take a look at our case study. It's gonna begin in Acts 10, one through eight. And week by week, we're gonna break down this entire chapter. It's one single large case study because we will all learn from this. And there's some other things that we will look at for ecclesia, but it says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. Isn't it interesting? When Jesus entered the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? And now he's about to teach Peter a lesson, and he's God speaks to a man in Caesarea. You never know why God is leading you to a certain place. The, the time will come 
where he'll reveal the work that he has for you. He had a work for Peter, but he was also working on Peter. He had a work for Peter, but he was also working on Peter. A centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. He's an Italian, he's a Gentile, he's outside of the Commonwealth of Israel, probably never been in a temple in his life, but he prays to God always. God told me to pause here and let you know there's some people who never set their foot in a church. But we're going to discover in this time of a pandemic that there are some people who are praying to God. They're praying earnestly. They don't know what to do. They need someone to direct them. They need someone to show them the way. But they're communicating with God. And God is just looking for someone on the earth who will be who be willing to go and to show them how to enter his ecclesia. He wants them to enter his ecclesia. And when that happens, everything else comes into place. Verse 3 says, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision. Here's a man who is outside of the known church in Jerusalem, and he saw a vision clearly, an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Verse five, now send men to Joppa. I want you to, to hear this. Now send men to Joppa. Here's a man who wasn't a churchgoer, but he was sincere. He prayed to God. His prayers came up to God as a memorial. He was outside of what we would call today Christendom. God is giving him the kind of insight that causes him to see prophetically. He's telling him about people he's never met. He's telling him where to find them. I wish God would give me an unction today to make this clear. This man is praying and God is giving him names and addresses of people who he never, ever met. That's the kind of God that we serve. That's what we were talking about in our last lesson about prophetic prayer. It's when our hearts are sincere towards God, he'll show us things that we know not of. He's meeting a need that Cornelius has that Cornelius hasn't even expressed. He just goes to God sincerely. God knows that he needs help and he's telling him where to find the help that he needs. Sometimes the things that we need, only the spirit of God knows. And so the spirit has to work in us and lead us to the way, to the place to get the help that we need. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. You see the specifics that God is giving him? He's like, you go send for Simon Peter, but he's at a man's house who's Simon the tanner. I need you to have this direction so that you don't confuse stuff. I want to make sure that you don't, there are two Simons. I want you to know that this one is the one whose surname is Peter. The other one is, in a, is a tanner, it's his house. I'm going to tell you where they are. They're right by the sea. And I want you to send somebody there. He will tell you what you must do. Why didn't God just answer him? God, if I'm Cornelius, I'm like, Lord, you know everything. Why don't you tell me? Because that's not how God works. He wants his ecclesia to work together. He had a work for Peter, but he was working on him. I've learned that some of the things that God tells me to do, I think I'm doing it for the other person. It's not just 
for them, God is also working on me. He's also working on you. He will show us what we need to do. And even though Peter was going to tell him what he must do, God, because Peter had a relationship, was telling Peter what he must do. God knows how to treat the babe, and he knows how to treat the one on, on strong meat. He brings us both to the same place. And when the angel who had spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. As I read this text, and I began to be ministered to by the Spirit, I say, God, never again will I say what you won't do in a person. Just because they don't live up to what I think godliness is, has nothing to do with what you see. And if I don't see what you see, I can't be the help that you send. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but there's something about Peter's devout Judaism that gave, that gave him bias. It didn't mean he didn't love the Lord. He said, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. By this time, he had done miracles. He had healed the man who was sitting at the gate called Beautiful, who had never walked in his life. He was 40 years old. And Peter said, gold and silver have I none such that I had. I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Why am I saying that? We can work the works of God and still have bias. We can work the works of God and still not recognize somebody that God is wants to call in to his ecclesia. And I'm saying, no, you don't measure up. You don't measure up. And so God never let that be said in New Covenant. Never let it be found in your servants. God, if there's anything like that, take it away from us so that we'll be ready, not just to hear, but willing to go so that we can bring them into a place where they know they are your special people, that they are a holy nation, that they're in a generation that you've called out. Let's go to Acts 10, 9, and 16. Now we're going to look at Peter. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. There's something about the timing of God that blows my mind. He didn't talk to Peter at the same time he talked to Cornelius. He talked to them as the men had journeyed for a day and got close to the city. He wanted Peter to know for certain that this is me because the stuff that I'm gonna tell you and what you're going to find when you go to the door, you're going to realize that this can't be made up. There are times when God seals his word in such a way that you know this is God. This has to be God. There is nothing coincidental about that. It can only be explained that this is a move of God. Verse 10 says, then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. He's going to pray and he got very hungry. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheep bound 
at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven. Now I want you to notice Cornelius, who's a babe, but he's earnest. His heart is right. And when, when God, when the angel spoke to him, he only had to do it once. Peter, who has experience with God, but has defined his holiness in a way that has been framed by his fathers, his ancestry, and his culture. And because of that, he says, not so, Lord. Now, when Cornelius, if you look at the verse where Cornelius said, what is it, Lord, in verse 4 of Acts 10, it's a small L. I want you to note that, those of you who has the Bible, have the Bible. But because Peter knows the Lord, he says, Lord, big L. Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. It's a mistake to try to impress God. He's telling God, no, nope, I'm not going to do this. What, did Peter think it was a test? He's like, I don't eat unclean stuff. God was working on him. And he told him using an allegory of something that he knew that Peter saw as defiled and unclean. And he said, what God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. You must not. What was God preparing him for? Somebody in the chat room, tell me. Was God preparing him to meet a Gentile who he thought was unclean? And he's teaching him a lesson to prepare him. Why didn't God just tell Peter, give him a command and tell him what to do? Because you don't learn lessons in commandments. God teaches us so that we can grow and develop and change. That's how transformation happens, is that when we learn, behavioral science says, learning is a change in behavior. And as we walk through verse or chapter 10, you're gonna see that Peter learned not just obedience, but he learned something about the people that God had prepared that were outside of his purview, that was broader than his perspective, that was different than what he perceived as godly people. To him, up until this point, godly people and God's people were Jewish and Jewish only. Even though he heard all the parables that Jesus told, even though he saw the faith of the centurion. And you know, you notice that the Syrophoenician woman who said only the crumbs and the centurion, Jesus would say, I haven't seen this kind of faith in Israel. What was Jesus doing? He was trying to provoke them to jealousy so that they would bring their faith up but it was hard for them to see it for what it was because they were blinded by the barrier of bias. And I want you to know that we're living in a generation where those same biases exist and it keeps us being the church defined by brick and mortar 
rather than moving to ecclesia, so that as one, we will say that somebody in Alabama and Mississippi will get a revelation and say what God has cleared. Don't call common. I feel the Holy Ghost. I believe God is going to begin to speak to the hearts of people and let them know you don't call unclean what I call clean. These are my special people. They are a holy generation. They are a royal priesthood. I call them out of darkness into light. And don't you slip into darkness by calling what I clean unclean. We're moving into a space where ecclesia is going to be rebirthed and the glory of God is going to be manifest in the earth and people are going to come to repentance. They're going to realize that their, their confidence has been in themselves and not in God. God is going to have to bring them to the place of where Cornelius was so that their prayers can be a memorial because right now, the social construct is their God. Their place in the world is their idol. And they don't understand what God has done and what God is doing. And so there are many things, ideology and political persuasion and upbringing and the feeling of being better that won't allow you to humble yourself and see what God is saying. The reason the Bible says that Cornelius's prayers came up as a memorial is because he was devout and he feared God. God told me one of the things that we've lost for the most part, when I say we, I'm not talking about us, but we, the ecclesia, is the fear of God. There's a generation of, of Christians who've grown up with just the doctrine of grace and the prosperity gospel. And all they want is what they can get. And they think they can throw caution to the wind and whatever they do, grace covers. And yes, where sin abounds, grace does abound much more. But shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. It's the fear of the Lord that causes us to approach him earnestly. It's the fear of the Lord that allows us to see stuff before it comes. Cornelius, who didn't have a lot of experience, but who prayed earnestly and often, God told him very specific stuff, name, place, address, and they're going to tell you what you need to do. God was able to speak to Cornelius with greater clarity than he did with Peter. He spoke to Peter by allegory. He spoke to Cornelius plain. It's the condition of our hearts that determine how God can talk to us. And God let me see that there's a part of his ecclesia who have not come to the place of understanding the harmony and the power of God that has cleansed every one of us. It doesn't matter your creed, your race, your upbringing, how much money you have or don't have. But if you have little, you are rich in faith because of God. If you have much, you need to throw that aside and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. I pray that this season of study in Ecclesia would bring us into a place of greater intimacy with God and would cause us to stir up love and good works among ourselves. I'm going to do something a little different. It's 8.02. Where does the time go? I can't, I can't say to any of you that you've interrupted me because we're not in the same room. So I have no excuses. Can I just have five more minutes? Would you indulge me for five more minutes? Okay, here's what I want to do. And you're going to respond by putting it in the chat room. How do you see Ecclesia coming forth during this pandemic? Anyone, how do you see Ecclesia 
coming forth as we've defined it during this pandemic. And here's the second question. While someone's working on typing that one, because of fear, I'm going to assume that is because of the fear of the Lord. Or people run to God because they fear. You see people on their faces in public in the nations of the world because they realize only God can help us. So there is a there is fear that is a temporary motivator. And then there's the fear of the Lord, which is a holy reverence. It's a respect. It's you come into God's presence in a way that honors, has honor that is more than anyone. The greatest, most important person on the earth is dust compared to God. Church will help binding up the brokenhearted which is prevalent throughout this world now. Here's the next question. And somebody said, like God did with Elijah, in a gentle whisper. There's something about that whisper that relates to Ecclesia. When God, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, a great teacher, and Nicodemus didn't understand. He's like, how can I be an old? Can I go back in my mother's womb? What do you mean being born again? That showed that it was his natural mind. Remember what Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. There are things that we understand because our eyes see and our ears hear. That's an indicator that we're a part of ecclesia, the invisible church. So Jesus trying to explain it to him said, the wind blows where it listed, and you don't know where it came from or where it's going. And he was teaching him that's what the spirit is like. You know how in the fall, when the dry leaves are on the ground and the wind blows, you don't see the wind, but you see the manifestation of its presence because the, the leaves are swirling, swirling. That's what the spirit of God is like in you and me. When we enter a room, they don't see God, but they sense something is moving. And that wind of the spirit is blowing like a whisper, not just a sound in your voice, but like the breeze of the wind that you know is there because the leaves are blow blowing. That's what it's like when Ecclesia shows up. Somebody says the Black Stocks is showing the compassion of Jesus and meeting the needs of those in the midst that are in our midst, practically and physically. Here's the next one, and I'll save the, the last one uh, that I have here for next week. How can we remove barriers so that the church can be one? Now, as you're thinking about that, Jesus prayed that the church would be one, which means the church is going to be one. But it also requires an act of the will for us not to be just tethered to something that is natural and physical, but to enter into the spiritual, because that's where he wants us to be one. And that's the expression of ecclesia. And that honest repentance, true repentance, that's how we remove the barriers, because when I earnestly repent. It opens me up to God. And I see things, including myself, differently. We can remove barriers as we serve and worship together. And as I said earlier, we are in different locations, but we're together tonight. And that is the essence of Ecclesia. No matter where I am, I could be all by myself in Wyoming, fly fishing, but Ecclesia is right there. The, the, the God who brought us together and formed us in one body, with Jesus being the chief cornerstone, never leaves us alone. And if 
you or I meet a new believer somewhere, there's an instant connection if we're on one accord, if we are both a part of ecclesia. I've met people who are Christians, but I didn't feel a connection. They call themselves Christian. In Antioch, early church were Christians because people saw them and said they had been with Jesus and they called them Christian. We're salt and light so that people see our good works and glorify God in heaven. It's not about what we say about ourselves. It's about those who see us. And by this, all people will know that we belong to God. We're his disciples because we have love one for another. Somebody said, Ecclesia is me and Pastor Tim. He and I had an exchange today. And it's, I'm going to leave you with this final thought. It's the story of someone I, I used to work with. And he came and was telling me he was lamenting about neighbor. And he said he's having problems with this person. This person has a very bad attitude. He can't seem to get through to him. And one day was reaching a high pitch. And the neighbor said, the things you're accusing me of are not true. I'm the easiest person to get along with. I'm a Christian. I am a Christian. So saying that he was a Christian was to validate everything. And the person said, I, I could care less about what the person's religious affiliation is. He said, we just had difficulty getting along. They were unreasonable. And I realized as they were telling me the story, that person is the worst kind of witness because what they said and the way they behaved was totally incongruent. And what that person saw, who was not a believer, was a person who was a hypocrite. And, and what they think is, okay, you can be a Christian and be mean and unreasonable and unruly and a bad neighbor when we're commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so part of what I pray that God imparts tonight to all of us as the ecclesia, we represent him in the earth. And that's why Jesus says you are the light of the world, not you will be, you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the entrance into your ecclesia, which you purchased with your own blood, Lord Jesus. You thought enough of us to die, to suffer, and to die on the cross, that we might have an entrance, that we might be blessed. We who were once cursed, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You took on the curse for us that we might be blessed. And because you blessed us, no one can curse us. We bless you, we love you, May we walk worthy of our calling from this time forth and even forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and thank you for indulging me and giving me those five minutes, even though I took 10. Bless you.